Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session on learning from COVID in India. It's it's a great panel. Um, looking forward to talking. There's just so much happening in India right now. Um, and I think it, this is the time when we start to look at, take stock of how India has been taking um, steps to control coronavirus in India um, compared uh, to the rest of the world. We've got a brilliant panel today. I'm going to introduce our panelists. We, we start with uh, uh, Rajiv Kaul, who's the past president of uh, AIMA and the current chairman of Nico Group in India. Rajiv, do you want to say hi? Uh, we have Vineet Mittal, who's chairman Avada Energy in India. And we've got Harsh Vardhan Neotia, who's the chairman Ambuja Neotia Group. We also have Asha Jadeja, who's trying to join. She's having some technical problems, but we hope that she'll be able to join us very soon. Um, so we'll start, we'll kick start with the panelists that we have today. Um, the, the situation that we are in today, we are in very unprecedented times. No one would have thought maybe a year ago or even six months ago that we will be in this situation. Um, when I remember personally, when last year around November, December, I was sitting down and making plans on where I wanted to go in 2020. So I made a list of all the countries that I wanted to travel and we started to book holidays one by one, starting with, um, you know, uh, Italy in February and India in April and then go on a cruise, Royal Caribbean cruise in May. And we started booking our holidays through the year as we generally do here. Um, but as January came along, we started realizing that, oh, actually, Italy may not happen. So we, we canceled February. Then by February, we realized, oh, India may not happen. So we canceled April. And now we've just canceled every holiday that we had for this year and next year because we just don't know when we are ever going to go on a holiday again. So this is one situation that has brought the entire world together. We are all in the same boat. Uh, speaking to colleagues across the border, when you say, oh, I have childcare problems because my son cannot go back to nursery, you always get a response saying, oh, I hear you, exactly the same problem here. This has never happened. This is very, these are very interesting times and very unprecedented times. But also this brings out the strength and the weaknesses that every country has in these situations the economic might, the, the the sort of strength that every country has to deal with a pandemic of this nature because they've never been exposed to something like this before. Countries have been exposed to things like the financial crisis of 2008, but then this is much bigger. That was that was different. This is very different. There are two different bear markets, as they say, in economy. So um, without further ado, I want to understand from our brilliant panelists today how have uh, countries, you know, how have in, how has India specifically been able to deal with a crisis of this order as compared to the rest of the world? And what's coming next? What's the, and there's still massive amount of uncertainty that's coming up. So um, each panelist has two minutes. I want to start with Vineet. Vineet, do you want to just quickly talk to us about what your thoughts are? And then we'll move on to the next panelist. Thank you. So the way I look at uh, this is the greatest uh, pandemic since the Spanish flu. And... Uh, greatest economic crisis since uh, Great Depression and at the same time, highest oil price decline in OPEC era. And but at the same time, the other great thing about this is this is the greatest central bank uh, intervention of all the time uh, in the world and across uh, every country. And uh, the, but the good news is that the world has seen much worse. Uh, uh, more than 50 million people had died during the Spanish flu, around 80 million during World War II, and around 30 odd million in World War I. So uh, uh, when uh, we look at uh, uh, this uh, as a leadership team and in our organization, we said uh, uh, we want to see this as an opportunity, not as a challenge or crisis. And we want to explore uh, if we are amazing leader and we said how we are going to do is to keep uh, the team, team together and uh, in a positive tone and uh, show our uh, amazing leadership by simplifying uh, our operation, uh, reinvent uh, the value proposition which our business has and, uh, and to gain the market share. We said uh, we have two ways to look at this. Uh, uh, so the, this is static for all our competition that the crisis is now here. And how we respond is going to differentiate uh, whether we survive post-COVID world or not. And we said, since our response is in our control, uh, let's uh, look at uh, what are the good things which we can do. Uh, so we uh, we are looking at a stronger and uh, better organization uh, uh, post uh, this crisis and uh, 
treat this as an opportunity. Thank you, Vineet. Um, I want to go to Rajiv now. Um, Rajiv, I want to pick your brains on what do you think um, about the current topic and how do you think uh, you know India can actually deal with it? Well, uh, thank you, Spriya, and it's great to be back with Frank on Horasis again. Uh, let me first just come to the COVID uh, bit. Uh, see, in India, the first one lakh positive cases came in 139 days. The second lakh came in 16 days, the third lakh came in 11 days, and the fourth lakh came in just nine days, right? So this is the bad news, uh, whether the flattening will start taking place after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we don't know. But let me come to the good news within this bad news. You know, out of the total confirmed cases that India has at the moment, which is uh, 425,000 or 4,25,000, 175,000 are active, but the recovered are much more. 237,000 have recovered. So the recovery rate is 64%, right? Now, when we look at the number of people who unfortunately are no more with us and who passed away due to the coronavirus, it's 13,000, which is just 3%, right? Which is uh, well less than the global average, which is around 5%. So, you know, within the bad news, there is a bit of good news. And I think uh, the, the flattening, in my view, will take a place another three or four weeks. And then uh, India should be back on its legs and feet and about to run. And I'll talk about maybe about that in the next round. So over back to you, Priya. Thank you. Um, my panelists are all very disciplined, sticking to time. So that's really good. Um, Harsh, over. So um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go. Okay. So what I would like to say is that when you said we are all in the same boat, I would just like to paraphrase it a little differently. We are all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. <laughs> as, as different companies, and de depending on which sector you are in and the scale at which you are, uh, we are differently impacted by this. Even in terms of the medical challenge that we face, if you are having good immunity, if you're in that very uh, good age bracket, you have very low risk. If you have comorbidities, if you're very old or very, very young, you are in a higher risk bracket. So whether it's on the health side or on the economy side, we are all in the same storm, but in different boats, having different capacities to survive uh, this pandemic with different levels of challenges and different um, uh, time frame with which you can survive it uh, or you will perish depending on how long this thing lasts. Now, unlike every other challenge that we have faced, be it an earthquake, a tsunami, a cyclone or tornado, usually it lasts for a few hours, maybe a day or two. And then maybe in a week or 10 days, we get a sense of the damage caused and we have a reasonable calculation of what has happened, and you can at least try to work around how you're going to fix it. But this pandemic is such that both in terms of its health challenge and the, and the resultant implications on the economy because of the lockdown, etc., we have no idea. We have absolutely no idea to make a, a reasoned estimate as to how much damage is yet to be caused as Rajiv Bhai mentioned, when is this flattening going to happen? Even if India flattens and it doesn't flatten in other parts of the world, uh, how much can we really recover from a situation? Because this is a very interconnected world that we live in, whether it's on supply chains, whether it's on mobility of people. A very large part of our economy depends on this completely um, free-flowing movement of people and goods from country to country. Uh, for instance, I heard in one webinar that uh, in, in Chennai, they had a re-lockdown for 15 days very recently. And there is a particular 
automotive manufacturer that one component comes his entire uh, automotive business is stuck because that component cannot come from chennai now he may have revved up every other production possibility to get going and he has the orders but now he can't uh, deliver them because one area has got into a strict lockdown and therefore it is affecting uh, a whole motorbike because a carburetor cannot come so these are the kind of problems that are there uh, right across and i think uh, we have to brace ourselves for pretty difficult times i think in general but true as vinith very rightly said we have to be optimistic we have to see that uh, through this what is there to how to navigate it i'm sure the world that we will enter post the covid challenge will be very different than what we left behind in 2019 and yeah. we will talk more about it uh, when i get the next opportunity to just say a few words yeah sure absolutely that's great thank you guys um i've simultaneously i've been running a poll which uh, asking our viewers oh there's asha as well hi asha hi asha hi asha yes you're on asha can you hear me yes hello hi 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 good to see you uh, we've just started the panel and we've been getting introductory remarks from our panelists uh, to introduce asha asha jadeja is a trustee at motwani jadeja family foundation in the us welcome asha um we've just gone through the first round i've asked the panelists to talk about what their initial thoughts um in the first 2 minutes <laughs> taking 2 minutes to talk about what can you really hear me? has we can hear you we can hear you can you hear us i can't hear you uh anya huh um asha would you mind going would you mind going on mute and figuring out what's going on so we can continue the panel as well yes i got you. i got it i'm fine can hear you now okay great so do you want to take 2 minutes and just talk to us about what uh, your thoughts are on the current topic how uh, how has india been managing the coronavirus pandemic and uh, what are the lessons to be learned your initial thoughts please so look nobody in the world has really handled the coronavirus too well unless it's an extremely small country and uh, it's run by a woman so <laughs> so as you can see the you know the prime ministers of new zealand you know germany norway finland some of these countries where there are women prime minister they've actually done well there's a correlation and i wish there would be a tangential study on that but in general this virus is a new beast so it is not something that can be easily uh, you know understood and uh, tackled given the current standard set of procedures that we have for other viruses so we even though we know something about sars for example or about ebola or about measles we still don't know much about uh, about sars cov 2 so the thing is that in that regard uh, really nobody has tackled it too well now as far as india goes for the size of the country it did a wise thing by doing a lockdown that's a wise thing but in terms of measuring and in terms of having standards for classifying who's got covid and who's not got covid who's who is asymptomatic who's not asymptomatic and how to treat these things of course we are uh, it is it i mean it has been um, you know i think it's been extremely tricky some cities have done well some states have done better than others but overall this is something that uh, i'm suspecting that we don't have full numbers we don't have full data on how many uh, people have been you know genuinely affected by this that said for the size of for a, for a 1.3 billion strong nation i think we've done pretty well in getting uh, you know folks treated as long as they made it to the hospitals and frankly and, and on a controversial note i do believe that uh, the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, chloroquine that we have used in india i think actually you know still i mean as against you know standard uh, practice right now standard opinion right now i think it's been a wise thing to use that because it has affected uh, the uh, you know it has mellowed out the effect of the cytokine storms in human beings that are affected by the virus so it has been a wise thing to use that medication as a preventive or even for you know reducing the load early load Okay thank you Asha um I will just request all the panelists to go on mute if you're not speaking just so that we can avoid the background noise and I can call you one by one once we need thank you I have been simultaneously running a poll as I mentioned uh with our viewers asking them has India been successful in handling the spread of coronavirus we're getting votes as we speak and it's pretty divided but still 
Um, we've got about 55% uh, people saying that yes, the India has been very successful and we've got 44.83% saying no, India hasn't been successful. So I want to bring in Rajiv here and I want to ask the same question from you. Has India been successful in handling the spread of coronavirus? And if yes, then what? give me one area where you think India has been successful and one area where India hasn't been successful. Ah, well, okay, I'll, I'll certainly uh, go towards that direction. But if you look across the world, all right, uh, and I'm now looking at the economic impact, uh, all the projections say that the U.S., GDP here will drop about maybe 10% or so, maybe 8%. Uh, when you look at Europe, uh, it'll be about 9%, but that's because Germany is, is doing relatively very well and their decline is going to be only around 4%, although UK again, maybe around 10, 11%. As also Italy and France who are doing, I mean, these three countries have done pretty badly uh, in Europe. On the ex other extreme, if you look at China, they'll probably be the uh, best performing major economy in the world. And actually, they may not have a, a decline, all right? They may have a sort of break even or a little bit of growth. Now, when you look at India, I mean, the various projections you see, the pretty worst projections that we see in our case is around 5%. Right? Now, it's shattering to have a uh, a negative growth of 5% when I think uh, perhaps we've never ever, even when the world was declining, had negative uh, growth rates. But having uh, said that, India was climbing the ladder in terms of the, uh, what should I say, the, the, uh, the, the, nation, the national GDP chart or the international GDP chart. And we had just about overtaken the economies of France and UK, and I think we were number five after Japan. That is USA, China, uh, Germany, uh, Japan, and then as India was number five. Uh, I think that batting order will probably still remain because the other countries have grown worse, and China, in any case, was way ahead of us, right? So, what have we done right? I would say what we have done right is a send money to the poor, to the poor of the poorest. We've sent that. We've also give send them things like cooking gas, etc. Okay, uh, we've give increased their rations. Some paid, some free. Uh, so these are good things, right? These are things which are necessary for survival. But what needs to be done now, this, this needs to be followed up to create demand because India was, India's growth story was substantively consumer driven and not that much investment driven, right? Right. Okay. Not investment driven despite uh, us having a relatively high savings uh, growth rate. Now that savings growth rate is kind of finished, whether it's corporate savings or individual savings or government savings, that's all gone. So we have to go aggressively for getting global savings into India. I think yeah. that's one of the big challenges. Rajiv, I'm going to stop you there and I'm going to jump on to other panelists. Uh, you're the point about investment is really interesting. And I want to bring in the uh, question of international perception here. Um, and um, my question is now open to Vineet, Harsh and Ashraf. Feel free to jump in. But does this change India's perception of, um, uh, you know, being a lucrative investment opportunity for the world, the situation that we have in India right now and the, the economic impact that it has had? Um, so the floor is open. Um, I, I mean, I don't know who wants to jump in. Harsh, go for it. I could go for it. Okay. Okay. So Harsh I, and then Asha. Yeah. So I certainly feel that India is going to be keenly watched by the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, it's still early days to say that we seem to have taken some good steps to uh, combat the COVID challenge. Uh, the world is looking at investment opportunities. Uh, there is a bit of stress on China because of its uh, adverse uh, sort of position in in view of the you know, 
pandemic. So I think India is certainly holds the promise. But I don't think this is going to happen overnight. I think it's going to take a while. But uh, we should uh, simply feel uh, that we are in a good position so far. Unless, of course, uh, because we are still at the very early stage in terms of the numbers, unless we sort of spin out of control. Uh, God willing, we won't. Uh, not only because of uh, the uh, measures that we have taken, but also it appears that there is a certain greater level of resilience of the Indian people to the virus itself, maybe because we were inoculated with uh, anti-tuberculosis and other medicines, or maybe because of the general higher level of immunity, or whatever may be the reason. So uh, I do believe that the spread is much larger than what's reported because a lot of it is asymptomatic and we are not able to know that. And testing, looking at India's population, is very, very inadequate. But whatever it is, since we know that the death figures can't be manipulated, since the death levels are still low, we assume that the virility of this disease is not very high. So looking at the general overall picture, my sense is India has done pretty well so far, uh, keeping our fingers crossed that we don't uh, slip up. And if so, I think we will have, uh, we'll be a very good and exciting destination for international investment. Thank you, Harsh. Um, Asha, over to you. And um, just a quick note for the panelists. As I mentioned earlier, if you're not speaking, please mute so everybody can hear the panelists without any background noise. So Asha and then over. Yeah, so I think, I mean, as a venture capitalist, right, from, you know, coming from the valley um, and in, I've been investing in India for the last about eight, eight, nine years now. For me, this is actually an opportune time. You know, there's there's no change in my perception. I know that Indian talent is is you know world class. I do know that the bureaucracy is getting in the way of Indian growth, and I uh, I am wary of the bureaucracy, but I'm ready to fight the battle. Actually, in terms of making sure that those of us who are in the diaspora can 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 speak very clearly about the bureaucratic and sort of red tape obstacles to the growth of our entrepreneurs and of our startups out of India. You know, running out of running away from India is not an option. A lot of companies do that. They go relocate in Dubai or in Singapore or US, but that's not an option. The next Google must come out of uh, of India. Why should it be from somewhere else? So, as far as I go, for me, this is actually kind of a good time to be investing in India. For example, the startup valuations are much lower right now because of uh, you know a lot of uncertainty right now. Angels are not investing as aggressively as they were doing. A few months ago, so I'm, I still look at some deals coming out, for example, from Mumbai Angels, and those are at at valuations that I had not seen in the past, which is kind of good news for venture capitalists. Um, and the market, uh, you know, is there's in fact that because of the new paradigm shift of having work and learning, both education and learning and work going online, there is a there is an enormous opportunity now. There is, uh, you know, this is almost like the birthing of the internet. This is a whole new medium on which we'll be learning and working. So the as far as technology sector goes, as you can see from Wall Street, the tech sector has been growing unimpeded here in the U.S., right? The growth is unimpeded. Why? Because as this new medium evolves for work and learning, especially, uh, and even for convening, I think, uh, you know, tech sector is going to be the one that's going to really, uh, you know, to not just survive, but do very well. It's actually going to thrive in this new environment. I do feel that this opportunity should not be should not be minimized in India. What you all who are based in India must do is to make sure that uh, the, you know, the policy obstacles around growth in India are, are you know, talked about openly. They're highlighted and talked about. But this is for Thank me, you. this is an opportune time. Thank you. That's great, Asha. Um, Vineet, over to you now to hear. So I would share my experience during the COVID. Uh, Government of India continued with uh, uh, their solar auctions and they took out a tender uh, for uh, 2000 megawatt, which is roughly around a billion dollar contract. And uh, most of the global investor, including us, and we had uh, players like Temasek, Brookfield, SoftBank, uh, bidding for the project and uh, we had bidded for a project uh, for 300 uh, or 400 odd million dollar and we got the half the capacity. 
So there is a strong interest uh, uh, in India. I think uh, uh, I asked one of the investor, uh, uh, why did he was so aggressive in the bidding? And he said that, uh, and before that I asked him that, uh, uh, how long do you think COVID will last and what will happen after COVID? And he actually said both of them are wrong questions. Uh, uh, because before that also crisis has come, crisis will come to make us stronger. And uh, they don't find any other market which has a depth uh, to absorb such a high investment. And uh, this was a sovereign fund, so they could not invest in uh, China because of their change policy. So they said besides uh, North America, uh, the other uh, market which is growing up uh, is India and we would continue to invest. So we see that during the COVID also, where even government was doubting if they should uh, take out this bid or not, the bid was over successful. And after that second tender came, that was also more competitive than uh, pre-COVID area, uh, pre-COVID time. So I see and believe that uh, uh, currently some of the private equity and venture capital fund might have become slightly cautious toward India, but I see large sovereign fund and uh, and the large uh, pension fund and patient capital, uh, they continue to invest and they have a huge appetite. And in current environment, they are finding it that the valuations are very attractive. And uh, so we see that uh, India has uh, uh, been able to prove that it can provide huge opportunity. And I see huge amount of money coming in infra and India has already announced its national infrastructure policy of trillion dollar investment over the next six years. And I think that investment will be the driving engine uh, for uh, uh, for bringing back uh, growth in India. So Hi. I think it's uh, Hi. having the spread. I think my personal view is India has done a, a very uh, uh, balanced uh, job on saving life and uh, saving businesses. So they, uh, based on uh, uncertain information which every country had, uh, uh, they did the best they could do uh, in addressing uh, coronavirus uh, uh, and economic crisis. Yeah. I think probably one area where they should do better is uh, doing more testing. Yeah. In India, the number of testing, like the place I live in Mumbai, they are just doing 4,000 to 5,000 testing a day. Whereas yeah. a small country like Korea is doing uh, much more. They have tasted 5% of population and we have not tasted 0.05%. So I think that's one area which will increase the confidence and remove uh, fear from the citizen if they increase the testing to 10x because... Uh, so, uh, Vineet, I'm going to stop you there just so that we can go on to the next points. But that's that's very interesting. And apologies, I had some internet issues, so I was out of action for about a few seconds. Um, but how can we increase testing capacity in India? I know that this is an area that we've been discussing for a really long time. Um, it, the numbers, numbers when you see coming out of India sometimes baffle you because when people say that one particular state has had two cases of coronavirus and then you 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 start to think that that's not possible because then you know some something else comes up and you're like oh death rate have gone up so um how how can india actually go ahead and uh, increase testing capacity is there enough uh, are there enough resources available if not then how is it that that can be ramped up um asha i want to start with you on that because i know you talked about it earlier the how do we ramp up testing well, right now in the U.S., I think the cost of testing has gone down radically. What I find here where I live in San Francisco, uh, pretty much every block, at every corner, there are signs which say, uh, walk up to the next Walgreens or the next corner for free COVID testing. So clearly, not only has the cost gone down, but I think people have figured out the problem of using the right kind of, you know, the... Um, you had to use right kind of tips for those swabs and things like that. I think the blood tests are still not fully accurate. I think the accuracy is anywhere between 70% and 95%. So uh, the blood tests that I, so there are two kinds of tests. One is, of course, the, the swab test, which you do in your, up your you know, nose or throat or something. That test tells you whether you are sick right now or not, if you are positive right now or not. But if you do the blood test, it tells you if you had it in the past and you have the antibodies. 
Now, since the blood test is so, uh, uh, you know, uh, right now it's not not fully, uh, eff- it's not very trustworthy right now. What's happening is people don't want to uh, see a false negative or a false positive. And as a result, people are still entirely depending on the swab test. But remember that the swab test only, uh, you know, only sort of green lights you for, I think, 72 hours. Which it says right now you're okay, but yeah, but you know so so I I mean I know frankly I don't know about the in, about Indian domestic capacity of manufacturing tests right now. You guys probably know better, but as far as uh, the uh, testing in the U.S. goes, I know it has gone. It's it's become so much cheaper now that I won't be surprised if uh, a similar cost reduction is happening in India. I do know that on the vaccine front. Uh, people like Kiran Majumdar Shaw and those guys are using their lab. You know, they have enormous factories and lab, labs that they can use for production of certain things. And I know that Kiran and Siddharth Mukherjee are working on, on developing that capacity for, for vaccine development. But uh, frankly, on the, on the production of testing kits and the whole testing, uh, you know, supply chain, I'm not fully sure where India yeah. is on that. Yeah, Harsh, you, is that something that you want to talk about? Because we mentioned earlier. Yes, I think uh, you know, looking at India's population of one point two or one point three billion, we are never going to be able to test enough in a short period of time. So this is uh, virtually impossible because uh, yes. not because of the cost, the sheer availability of kits, and the sheer availability of medical professionals and uh, you know, equipments to sort of diagnose what is tested. So the question is, can we direct our testing to those areas where we find that there is a more serious need? And yes, the testing has gone up considerably in India and it will go up. But even if you take the pace at which it is going, uh, there was some calculation that it is going to be some 20, 30 years now. God willing, we are not going to have this pandemic last us for uh, more than a few months, maybe at best a year. So we we really will not be able to test uh, as much as we ought to and need to. And therefore, I think directing it to hotspots and areas where there's a problem is, to my mind, the only real solution for India. Thank you. We have about 13 minutes, 12 or 13 minutes, and we've got lots of questions coming in from uh our viewers as well. I want to quickly move on to the economy very quickly. Now, the, now I want to bring Rajiv in here. Um, we've ha- we've seen developed countries. Uh, we've seen the U.S., we've seen U.K., Europe coming up, come up with um, you know tranches and tranches of stimulus. Uh, India, do, do you think India has the capacity to deal with something like this with that level of economy, economic stimulus? Um, I think I'm not sure who's on unmute. You guys, if you can go on mute. Um, uh, Shriya, yeah. you're coming uh, rather loudly. If you speak softer, it'll be easier for me to understand. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So, can you? Is everybody on mute? So, I think my voice is echoing a little bit. Yeah. Now it's fine. Uh, all right. My question is that all the developed economies, such as the U.S., the U.K., um, Europe as well, has been coming up with tranches and tranches of economic stimulus. Um, in India, we see that that's still lacking a little bit. We've seen one stimulus come in, but the government hasn't been able to come up with more economic stimulus. Do you see uh, India? How do you see India dealing with the economic crisis? Um, yeah, I, 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 I sort of do agree that other countries have given, uh, particularly European and you know the advanced countries, including Japan have given very large doses of stimulus, right? Which uh, I think in the USA now it's reaching 15% of their GDP. In India, everything put together around is around 10%. And when I say everything, uh, in this includes the Reserve Bank of India lending to companies who in any case uh, are, are good bets. Let's put it that way. So uh, whilst the percentage of stimulus is not enough, I'd say the balance that the government has done is okay. And if they've given anything a little less, I would say it is in helping the poor people, right? So they need to now give a second round and perhaps a third round of direct transfer to the people who are poor. 
that will certainly give a fillip to people and it's very necessary from a humanitarian point of view as well coming to uh, the what they've given they've done a wonderful job for the msme sector you know firstly they reformed it in that they've changed the definitions and limits and previously really the sme sector was by european or american or british standards really the tiny sector it's no longer so now the top end of the msme sector it are some people who are genuinely a uh, medium scale right whether it's jobs whether it's turnover or whether it's investments plus they've supported this in terms of the banking limits they supported this in terms of giving government guarantees for loans the government is fully aware that the biggest damage in terms of jobs right and the loss of jobs is come in this sector and they are doing their utmost to try and protect it and in fact you had asked me what was handled badly earlier on i didn't answer that what was handled in my view and in not in the best fashion was the movement of migrants back to their villages but having said that i mean now that's the past but now there's a tremendous pressure of reverse movement the migrants want to get back because the factories have opened shops are opened and there's a shortage of people so actually the same jobs now people are paying more for doing the same job right so i think there's a lot that's happening uh, the government has supported they will continue to support and in fact we have regular webinars with all the important economic ministries and they are very open minded they take notes and if you ask me one of the big positives that's come up come out of this is that the government now is having a huge amount of dialogue with industry and business and and let me let me close on this so others can come in Thank you. Um, thanks, Rajiv. Um, I, Rajiv, do you want to mute so I can? Can you go on mute, Rajiv? Can yeah, I just respond, Rajiv? Yes. You want me to mute? Go on mute. Mute, please, Rajiv. Thank you. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say something. You know, to what Rajiv was saying. Rajiv, you're right that the government is engaging in dialogue. but will that result in real change though what do you think i'm 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 unsure about you know government really doing anything dialogues yes it does have it has regular convenings and so on but do you think it's there is, a, is i mean is real policy change likely to happen that's a great that's a great question um asha has taken over my job so over to go ahead just just mention it again very quickly no my question to you raji was that um, i know that the government keeps having a lot of dialogue it has it's very good with having dialogues convening meetings and so on but uh, will will that really translate into serious policy change will the government be able to get out of the way no i mean uh, i i agree with you that uh, you perhaps there was over dialogue but previously the dialogue was done through previously previously the dialogue was done substantively by a follow up mechanism of committees now that committee culture is gone so the government now is not going through committees the government is going directly by saying yes or no or maybe right so they are very very clear on this and they are acting this has been one of the big benefits i would say uh, uh, due to this unfortunate uh, pandemic that we have had that the government is acting the bureaucrats are acting people are working exceptionally hard the frontline workers and not just on the medical side be it on the uh, telecom side they be it on the uh, power side you know they've really been doing a, a, a very good job and you know i think uh, uh, I, I, the economy is coming back and we heard piyush uh, uh, our minister in the morning piyush goel and he gave figures our exports were down 60% uh, in april 
in May it was down to uh, 25 and in June on a day to day basis it's down 12 percent. So they are expecting in July it will be positive. Of course, one of the reasons is the oil prices come down and that's very much in our favor. Another thing is our foreign exchange reserves are increasing. They are increasing week by week. We have the highest foreign exchange reserves ever in the third month of our pandemic. You know, so action is taking place, believe you me. And especially for people like you uh, who are sort of backing startups, the India is going to become a great place. It was already a great place. It's going to get an even better place for startups. It's going to create a lot of jobs. And particularly in the uh, IT space, in the VR space, in the AR space, in the AI space, and also in the manufacturing space where you require all these technologies. Okay. Thank you, Raji. We've got three minutes left. So um, if everybody can go and mute and we'll do some closing thoughts. So my question now is for each one of you, and I think maybe let's take 30 seconds each to answer that question. We've got lots of research showing that, uh, you know, until a vaccine comes along, we will not go back to normal and we will live in this new normal. Um, there are studies from Harvard that say that social distancing will be in measure will be in place till until about 2022. Now, social distancing in India is often considered a privilege of the middle class or of the higher uh, earning class. It's not something that um, low income groups can actually exercise. How do you think um, social distancing or what the new normal in India is going to be? I'm going to go on mute, but I want to start with uh, Asha and then on to Harsh, Vineet and then Rajiv and we'll close there. So 30 seconds each. I think there'll be significant uh, variations in the way people respond to the, you know, to the way India opens up from, you know, from middle class to lower income to really lower income group. People who people who might be living in slums will have very different choices from those who are in the upper classes. So there's, it's going to be very different. And I think there's going to be variation by sector also in the sense that those who are in IT will be able to work very effectively from home, while those who are in, in brick and mortar businesses will have to will have to show up and I think they are they're going to be at risk. Thank you. Yes, I agree. Uh, you know, there are two types of uh, social distancing requirements. One is essential, what you have to do for a living and what you have to do for physically living. And the other is what you do for lifestyle. Uh, so I think there will be a huge curtailment in lifestyle related things, whether it is you know, cinema going or large gatherings or large weddings or, uh, you know, things like that will probably be curtailed during this period till the vaccine is not prevalent everywhere. And then there are essentials, people who have to go to work. They have to still use public transport. They have to live in homes that they can afford and uh, in, in colonies that are congested because uh, that's where they have that home. So I don't think uh, it's going to be uh, simple for them to have social distancing in those essential areas. So I think we will have to see it rather than seeing it between upper and lower classes, which is, of course, one parameter. There will be another matrix. And this will be what is essential and what is not essential. Thank you, Harsh. Um, Vineet, over to you. One minute, 14 seconds left. So just take very quick 30 seconds. Uh, in my opinion, maybe a new normal would be keep people who have realized after living in home for three months that you can live with very uh, minimal needs. You don't need uh, too many fancy, expensive clothes. You don't need uh, big cars. You don't need uh, uh, other materialistic things to bring you happiness. Uh, so people are becoming more and more uh, environmentally friendly, conscious, and uh, it's to do with people's attitude and uh, what I have seen is that uh, even people, uh, I live in Juhu where there are many slums also, uh, they are uh, more optimistic and positive uh, uh, than uh, people living in the building because uh, they Maybe believe- I'll have to cut you short there. We're running out of time. I can see the clock ticking here. I just wanted to thank everyone before this whole thing stops quickly. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you for the poll. Thank you to panelists for your brilliant views. This has been an extremely interesting um, panel to moderate and I wish we had more time um, but we've got time is running out with seven seconds left so big thank you everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice thank to meet you all. Bye all. Thank Thanks. you.